This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I want to introduce everyone to the stage. Joe Palladino, Bob Gale, Chris Soldo, Perry Lang, Mike Medicino, oh, I've switched you, and yep. Sandy Stokes, and Ross Melnick. So a great movie, a, a movie I've loved for a long time, and a movie I've heard you talk about how it came to be. And I'd love to hear again, just like the story of what you and Bob were looking at as first as the story is coming through, and then it's sort of crazy journey into being as it went from Studio yeah. to studio. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, Bob Zemeckis and I were, how old were we? Were we? This was uh, around 1975. So we were 24 years old. We uh, got out of USC film school, and uh, we were uh, trying to figure out how we were going to get in the industry, writing this, writing that, doing television. Um, we wrote a spec script uh, called Tank, uh, and in the process of researching stuff in that movie, we came across the real historical incident that took place in February 1942 when the city of Los Angeles uh, blacked out. They thought that there was an air raid, and for six hours, one night in February, um, uh, anti-aircraft battalions shot up at the sky at nothing. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things, you, you do research, you, you, you file little things away in your head, and we said, ah, that's, that's interesting, that's a pretty interesting story. The script tank that we wrote, we uh, were submitting it all over, and we submitted to John Milius, uh, who had also gone to USC, and um, Milius read it, uh, he, he, he liked the script, not enough for him to want to make it, but he had just made a movie at MGM called The Wind and the Lion, uh, which is a terrific movie. And MGM loved the movie, and they gave him a four-picture deal. Uh, two movies that John was going to write and direct himself, and two that he was going to produce. And he said, uh, you know, he, he liked us, he liked our script, he said, uh, he said it exhibited a great sense of social irresponsibility, <laughs> which he appreciated. <laughs> and uh, he asked us if we had any ideas for, for movies that, that he could shepherd as a producer. And we told him this idea about the, uh, about the LA Air Raid. And John was a big history buff. He had, I don't know if he'd actually written it or he was researching a movie about uh, General Stilwell. And he knew that Stilwell had been stationed in California uh, during the first three weeks of World War II. So he said, oh yeah, we could put Stillwell in the movie, let's move the date of it up a week after Pearl Harbor and we'll, we'll put Stillwell in it. And uh, I got a great title for it, we're gonna call it The Night the Japs Attacked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we set it up at MGM and uh, this was the first script that Bob Zemeckis and I got actually paid money to write. Uh, I think it was uh, $15,000. And um, we, wrote, we wrote two drafts, and um, Milius, uh, we, incorporated, we incorporated two other historical incidents into this. One of them was that what precipitated the LA Air Raid was a Japanese sub uh, appeared off the coast right near here, uh, where the old Richfield refinery is uh, near, near Bacara, the Elwood uh, and Sandpiper golf course up there. And it shelled, it shelled the coast. There's a plaque up there that, that uh, commemorates that. Uh, it, was, it was a day and a half later um, that the fact that a, that a sub got that close 
put Panic into L.A. and and uh, was provocative for the air raid, false air raid. And then the Zoot Suit riots uh, actually took place in 1943, uh, and that was just such an insane thing that we said, well, let's put that in the script. Yeah, we were 24 years old. So, <laughs> what are we going to do? Let's, let's put a riot in, sure. Uh, let's have the Japs blow up an amusement park, sure. Let's, let's uh, have a dogfight over Hollywood Boulevard, why not? So we wrote all this insane, insane stuff in because uh, uh, we were not yet adults. <laughs> and um, uh, Milius is, is good friends with Spielberg, and he's telling Steven about these two insane guys that, uh, that he'd hired to write this crazy ass script and he's telling Steven some of these scenes and Steven says, I gotta read this script, I gotta read this script. And uh, Steven read the script and he said, I gotta direct this, I gotta direct this after I do Close Encounters. So that's how it happened. That's <laughs> okay. And Perry, I know your connection to this film is sort of connected to John Milius too. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, well, you're coming into this picture and then just... Well, I had worked with Milius on Big Wednesday, so there was a, <laughs> there was a, 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 a moment, actually, well, Bob and Bob championed me because I had auditioned for I Want to Hold Your Hand, which was uh, uh, their first movie, which was great, and, um, and then... Uh, um, and then Milius weighed in in a particular moment with Spielberg, where Spielberg wasn't sure if he wanted to give one part to Bobby DiCicco and one part to me, and had to swip, swap them at some point. But um, and uh, and uh, so Stephen was trying to make a decision, and Milius um, forced him into that decision at, at that moment. So I owe Milius not just my first movie. Big Wednesday, but also, you know, yelling at Steven Spielberg to, <laughs> to give me a job. Yeah. Um, Bob, I wonder if you can talk about the way, and Mike too, the way that this, uh, the restoration we're looking at today, this expanded version, how this got to the screen here in 2015. This has a long history that dates back to 1981. Yeah, the, the version, as I said at the beginning, um, this, this version, uh, it's only the second time it's been shown to an audience. Uh, it was never sneak previewed in this form. Um, Steven shot a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And there's about 10 or 15 minutes of great scenes that aren't, in, that aren't in, even in this version. Uh, and who knows where those are. But uh, he was... Um, he had a hard release date of, of Christmas 1979. The movie had been uh, already advertised as a trailer in the theaters, um, and there was no way that the movie was not gonna open uh, Christmas 1979. And as you can imagine, seeing all this stuff, the movie went way over budget and went way over schedule. And uh, um, Stephen was scrambling to, to put it together. Um, he had a sneak preview in Dallas. Um, he decided to make some radical changes. He decided with uh, uh, John Belushi's star, uh, the highest in the heavens of anybody in the movie, uh, he went back and he shot a couple of more bits with, with John Belushi. And he uh, always wanted to keep the running time of the movie uh, no more than two hours. So he began to cut uh, some of the connective story stuff out of the first half of the movie uh, for the sake of as much of the gags that he could do. Um, so there were, uh, there were, then there was another sneak preview in Denver, and I think he made a few more changes after that. Bob and I were already making our next movie, so we weren't really uh, in the mix at that point. Uh, we went to the sneaks, but didn't really have any input. Um, the movie opened, um, it, was, uh, it was critically trashed. Uh, Stephen was rather bruised and battered from that experience because uh, he made Jaws and he made Close Encounters and everybody thought, well, the next thing he's gonna do is gonna be great and uh, they weren't prepared for this. So um, 
about two or three years later, when the movie finally ran on network TV, uh, ABC was trying to figure out how they could promote it in a way to get more people to watch it. And so they decided, what if we added some of the scenes back in that had been cut out? And that's what they did. And most of these scenes were, were in that version that ran, I think it only ran one time on ABC. Um, I had an old Sony Betamax, I bought one of the first ones. And so I recorded, I recorded off of ABC. And uh, uh, years later, when it was time to uh, do a laser disc, and I, I said to the guys at Universal and, and, and Steven's post-production people, we ought to put all those other scenes back in. And nobody knew where the scenes were. Hmm. Uh, they didn't even know what they were. And I pulled out those old Betamax tapes. <laughs> and uh, here they are. <laughs> uh, oh, OK. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we can find these. So uh, the movie was reconstructed uh, for Laserdisc. And then um, uh, that was 1995. And then uh, it was released on DVD, I think around 1999. Uh, and it was still had some rough spots. And uh, it turned out that uh, a lot of the music cues for the added stuff uh, weren't correct. And I'll turn it over to you, Mike, because uh, Mike worked on the restoring the score for a CD release. And Mike found these cues that nobody thought existed anymore. Well, to just fill in a couple of little holes there, there was a tendency in the uh, late 1970s and really all through the 80s to add scenes into network <coughs> broadcast. And in those days, particularly before you even had home video, once something was gone from the movie theater, you caught it on network television. And a lot of movies, we suddenly saw all these extra scenes and people wanted them. And uh, when it aired in 1983, this is a year after E.T., and suddenly there's a lot more attention on Steven Spielberg and everything he did. And so there was kind of, there started to be a groundswell of interest in the movie that hadn't been there in 79. Um, and so, as Bob said, in 1995, when it came out on Laserdisc, which was an opportunity to present what was at the time the high-end sort of technophile format, and, it was the, and we were getting to see it in widescreen, it was an opportunity to construct the version for that. So, uh, visually, this version has existed since then. Um, and uh, someone I need to give a shout out to is Jeff Kava, who uh, was at Universal at the time. He's now at Paramount. This was so involved to put this together, just physically to film, um, that they kind of hired other people to do his regular job so he could work on just that for a period of months to put it together. And part of that was also the soundtrack um, they had a six-track printmaster that was made for, I guess, very few 70 millimeter prints that probably didn't run very long, I imagine. Um, all the 35 millimeter prints went out in monaural sound. So they had to put all that together. For whatever reason, the added footage was at Columbia, Sony. The theatrical version was at Universal, so they had to kind of put their heads together and make all that work. Um, then. Um, it kind of just sat on DVD as just sort of the ported over laser disc transfer from 1999 on to about 2011 when I worked on um, putting out for the first time the complete score. And uh, please make my evening and tell me that uh, you guys like John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, one of his most phenomenal scores, and I mean, it, you know, it's coming in the middle of this amazing 10-year period where he had Jaws and Star Wars and Close Encounters on Super and Superman on one side, The Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., Return of the Jedi, and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom on the other side, right just uh, on the eve of him taking over the Boston Pops and then writing music for NBC News and the Olympics. I mean, he was just at an unbelievable peak and wrote this magnificent score. So uh, in really researching the music for the first time in detail about exactly what was scored and what wasn't, um, I found that some of the scenes, as they existed in this extended cut, matched the music as originally intended. What they had done on the Laserdisc was matched what had been sort of cobbled together for the TV broadcast that had been the template. So um, 
when we heard this was finally going to be happening in high definition, I asked Bob, this is, you know, can we approach Stephen's office and say, this is an opportunity to kind of give this sort of a seamless polish that it never really quite had. And I think we can do this with just fixing a few music cues and a few sound effects of things that were still a little bit raw. And I said, just to give it that extra bit of glue. Um, for anybody in the film program, you know, you're going to discover really that the music can be the glue that sort of holds something together that's uh, not quite working. But I advise you, don't rely entirely on it. Don't use it as a crutch. <laughs> but uh, in this case, where you have a movie that's just so close to being um, really seamless, it was just a few extra little things and things that bothered me and an opportunity to, again, um, be truer to the original vision because John Williams had written score for certain scenes. It was an opportunity to, to put it back in. So um, we did it last summer. We actually had wanted to make a few editorial changes that um, reflected, I guess, probably the original cut and closer to the screenplay. We were a little bit too late for that, but we were able to polish up the sound. And apparently, the result was um, good enough that uh, Stephen said, yes, this is approved, and said to Universal, can you make a DCP of this? And they said, certainly, Mr. Spielberg. And <laughs> so we have it to uh, show and exhibit um, now for all time, which is great. And uh, Bob and I worked for a while to find just the right time and place to um, uh, show it in a theater. We did it at the Egyptian on March 22nd, and we turned it into an event. Uh, I ended up moderating a panel of 11 people. Um, with a reception beforehand, and it was a packed house, and it, it was really just really phenomenal how it played. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can um, you know get the word out. I think it probably plays better now than it did then. It's sort of come oh, much come in into its time. Much better. And yeah. um, you know, and now hopefully we can. Um, it, it's it, it didn't make sense before. I mean, it really. I mean, it was. We we went to the premiere at the Cinerama Dome, and and you. It, it was a very loud movie, <laughs> and, uh, and it, this connecting tissue that you cut in, or that was cut in, just makes the film work on a whole different level that it never did when it was first released. And Mike, you were talking earlier about one of, one of the scenes that's been added, the, uh, the tree scene. Oh, and then no. and, and the effect of music on it. Well, that. when I first told Bob that that was one of the scenes that I um, said the music really needs to be fixed, I'm going to get really sort of esoteric here. There's um, a sec different section of the score where um, Williams quoted the um, Austrian national anthem. It's written for the scene where they throw Christopher Lee, Christopher Lee into the water. And I'm like, well, that does not belong in the scene with Slim Pickens and the, and the Japanese. It always drove me insane. I'm like, that's one scene that needs to be rescored. Bob says, I hate that scene. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, we didn't want to write it. You want to tell that story? Uh, yeah. I mean, again, this is, going back to what I said earlier, uh, Stephen was at a point where they would just let him do anything he wanted. So Stephen would, Stephen would say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to, I got a great idea. I'm going to do this. And he had this idea that he wanted to have in, in, the, in the script that, that Bob and I wrote originally, the, the Japanese never left the submarine. They were always a shadowy force off the, off the coast of California. Stephen said, I got this great idea. Um, we're going to have the, the, the Japanese come ashore, uh, and they're going to find a hot dog stand, and they're going <laughs> to cut the hot dogs up like sushi. Because Stephen was going to the sushi restaurant every night on Sunset Boulevard. He was having sushi every night, so he was, had sushi on the brain. So he wanted to put this in the movie. And, and, and Bob and I said, we're not going to write that. That's stupid, Stephen. <laughs> so, so, he got, so he got John Milius to write it. And the, the gag at the end was a guy whose who's, uh, shack it was comes and sees the, the Japanese in there, and he goes, yeah, and he runs away. And so Stephen casts Slim Pickens, the, one of the greatest character actors in the world, to play this guy who has basically no part. And Stephen, Stephen comes in to the office one day, and he says, oh, geez. I cast the greatest character actor in the world, and I got nothing for him to do. <laughs> and he says to us, can you guys write something for, for Slim Pickens to do? Can you come up with something to, to give, him a, give him a part? Um, 
and Bob and I are huge Slim Pickens fans. We're huge fans of Dr. Strangelove. And we came up with this, this gag. They're looking for, um, actually, I think, I think it, was, it was Brian De Palma that suggested that his name be, be Hollis Wood and, and, and do the, mm. the Hollywood Who's On First gag. Um, but the whole compass thing in the, in the Cracker Jacks and stuff, we came up with that. And we wrote these scenes, and, and they were really funny. And Steven said, oh, now I got a better idea about, about the Japanese kidnapping him. We're going to use the old Three Stooges gag, where the Three Stooges dress up like trees and, and, and are running around. And I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do with the Japanese. And we're going, oh, my God. <laughs> really? You're really going to do that? Really? And what happened in one of these, uh, in the first preview, as a matter of fact, um, the scenes with Slim Pickens on board the sub, they got huge laughs in the audience. And the, the scene with the trees, it, it didn't play that well. So Stephen decided to cut the scene now with the trees. Uh, and there's a truncated version of how Slim Pickens ends up on the, on the sub uh, in, in the theatrical cut um, so that he could leave in the, leave in the, uh, leave in the scenes uh, uh, the, the shit or die scenes, as, as, as we call them. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that was uh, that was why the uh, the Christmas tree scene was always anathema to to, to, to Bob and me. And yet, so it had the Deutschland Deutschen über alles right. since 1983 in the TV cut, the laser disc, the DVD drove me crazy. <laughs> and I said, you know, I think I can make this work. It so happens that the Cracker Jack scene, which I guess they tried to get. Cracker Jack. To yeah, they, they so say they popper, the jacks in this right. case, popper Jacks. Cracker Jacks wouldn't so. give permission because they thought, you know, oh, kids will start swallowing, swallowing the prizes. You know. So it turns out that <laughs> whole scene had piece music written for it that wasn't used. They just dropped it and played it with no music. And I said, this is an opportunity to take a music that is, doesn't exist anywhere else in the picture. Let me try it. Play around with a little. And lo and behold, for some reason, it had like some of the Japanese. Um, motif for the submarine crew as part of it. Somehow it worked. And um, just, you know, had to create music for the scene, played it for John Williams. He said, yeah, this is great. This is, you know, uh, let's see a test. You know, they showed it to Steve and he says, yeah, this is great. So um, I, I think I sent you a clip. You did. <laughs> and uh, my buddy there, Ted, who helped me coordinate the Egyptian uh, screening, said, I'll bet you, because he looked at it first, he says, I'll bet you $20 that Bob Gale laughs now. <laughs> I says, he says he hates the scene. He didn't want it, right? He didn't, he didn't have any of the Slim Pickens. He has his own cut of the movie with no Slim Pickens in it at all. <laughs> and um, <laughs> then he cut on video. He says, OK. He emails me. He says, uh, he says it's funny now. <laughs> I said, you see what, the, what music can do. And so I lost $20. <laughs> oh, sorry. So the cast. <laughs> <laughs> the casting of Slim Pickens, the casting of, of so much of this film, Stanzi, if you could talk a little about casting, because we, we were talking about how many people's firsts, uh -huh. and then how your, what your role was. Yeah, I was uh, the assistant casting director at that time. Um, different last name <laughs> that I'd forgotten. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was really interesting, because uh, we had quite a long time before the film to cast. And then it's the only film I've ever been kept on, Sally and I were kept on for the entire shoot of the movie because Stephen would get these ideas, <laughs> you know, on the set. And we'd get this call from the set. And he's, well, we need this extra sailor that can do this flip roll thing that, that uh, um, uh, Donovan Scott, the actor that, that did the sailor that got thrown out and was drunk and all that. And we had to, like, you know, do a quick, oh, who do we have? What do we have? And it was so much fun because we got to go through all these amazing, like Slim Pickens, who we all idolized, um, and, and cast people, and Christopher Lee, who's still working a lot, um, and all these like really great character actors. Um, Ned Beatty was really big at the time, and, and uh, um, uh, Lionel Stander and, and Robert Stack. I mean, he had been Warren, on The Untouchables. Warnos. And I think that was like his first comedy, too. I, I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think his, it was. His first, first comedy role, and he was great. Um, he was General Stilwell. Um, but we also got a chance to find 
the newer, younger talent. And we actually pulled from I Want to Hold Your Hand that Sally and I also cast. Um, we pulled uh, Bobby DeChico, who was the young hero, um, and Wendy Jo Sperber, who was always chasing Treat Williams, uh, <laughs> and Nancy Allen, right? And Eddie. Hmm? And Eddie Deason. Oh, and Eddie. How could I forget <laughs> Eddie? Oh, my God. Um, the guy on the Ferris wheel. <laughs> and we had cast them all in I Want to Hold Your Hand. And um, um, in that one, some of them had already done some stuff. Others were totally new. I think Nancy Allen was about the only one that was like well known on I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, so we got to bring them in. And then it's so funny because I'd forgotten he barely had, he had like two lines. But we, Taft Hartley, which is, you know, made, it was his first SAG role, was Mickey Rourke. And he's part of the tank crew. You barely see him, and he does not look like he does now. A <laughs> <laughs> little skinny guy. And he had like, and, but Stephen loved him. And so we were able to, you know, cast him. And usually it's hard to give people their first breaks because SAG is very difficult um, with, because there's so many SAG actors. Um, but what Stephen wanted, Stephen got. Um, and it was just so much fun. And then, of course, having Belushi and Aykroyd, who were you know huge at the time. Um, so it was really one of the most fun things, because we got to use all these wonderful actors and actors that I had grown up with. I was in my like early 20s when we did this. And, um, and then find all the new talent, too. And I have to say, the tree scene is my favorite. <laughs> I've got to be the one. That, I love that scene. I love that scene. Uh, just had well, it played well at the Egyptian, and it played good tonight, yeah, it too. Yeah, played so. great, because I was so now. disappointed you know, in the original. And I was like, wow, you know. It didn't all make sense then, you know, without, without that tree scene. So. I just want to know, it's like, if you, what movie would you possibly have Slim Pickens, Tashir Mifuni, and Christopher Lee in the same scene. That's if you told somebody, exactly. oh, those yeah, these three guys are in a scene together, you're like, what in the hell and is they're, scene? And they're all speaking a different language. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and they're just, yeah, it works. <laughs> and at the time, Toshiro Mifuni was the, uh, well, he still is, probably one of the greatest Japanese actors of all time. And that we got to bring him over to, to be in the film. And he had to have his translator because he didn't speak much English. Um, but yeah, that's right. All three of them in. <laughs> in I mean, and, and not only was it was it uh, a big, huge scale uh, movie, but Toshiro Mufuni decided uh, on one of his last days to throw a sushi party on the stage. That's right. And our cast and crew was so huge that I've really never seen. Forget extras. I've never seen more sushi assembled <laughs> in one place at one time. Like and the rumor was he stayed up all night and made a lot of it himself. I don't know if that's <laughs> that's true or not. But this notion of it playing, I think, is one I just want to return to for one second because I think the the question about bringing this film back, 2015, and the version that you like and the version that has the sound cues fixed. It kind of um, makes you think about what does it mean to, to do this kind of work, to bring this back to an audience. I'm just curious about your sense of sitting here now for the second time, seeing this with a new audience, what that means for you, um, and the difference between doing that and hearing from a friend of yours, I saw the Blu-ray, the new cut looks great. Mm. Well, um, well, for me, um, I've said this every time we screened it, that we all know the career that Steven Spielberg went on to have. and. Um, so we know that that career is going to be studied. And you can't really take a true assessment of it and skip this film. You can't go from Close Encounters on one side to Raiders of the Lost Ark, Lost Ark on the other and understand that creative transition because um, you know he's quoted in the, in the Richard Schickel book in an interview with him that he felt like Teflon when he made this and that he got sober really fast and quickly uh, learned his lesson on Raiders and pulled a movie in under budget, under schedule, much more economy. Even Jaws and Close Encounters are both very successful, they, but they both were very over budget, very much over schedule. And the other thing that, that is, is interesting, um, he had stronger producers on, on Jaws and Close Encounters uh, and Sugar Land too, but Stephen, um, on those movies, he had, uh, he had a tendency to, to just go overboard and, and do some 
do some crazy stuff because he felt like doing it. Uh, in Jaws, there's a sequence that, thank God, is not in the movie, that has, it's a whole sort of Keystone Cops thing with all the boats in the harbor trying to get out of the harbor to go when, when all the, when the, when the reward is first offered for the shark. And there's like, the, he did a four or five minute scene with all these gags and stuff, and it was, it, it just didn't really work for the movie. And uh, in Close Encounters, um, and you were on the big set for that, right? You well, were down at the big set in Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were Bob, massive production. Bob, Bob Zemeckis and I were uh, flown down to Mobile, Alabama to do uh, rewrites on 1941 uh, while Stephen was shooting Close Encounters. But um, uh, in the original cut of Close Encounters, uh, there's an awful lot of, of Richard Dreyfus building Devil's Mountain out of mashed potatoes and, and whatever. And when Stephen went back and revisited, he ended up cutting a lot of that stuff out. So he, he, Stephen would have a tendency to, to just you know really go overboard on scenes, you know, looking at the looking at the trees instead of the forest, and say with 1941, I think that if he had had another month or two or three, maybe he would have he would have uh, worked this thing out a lot better. Um, uh, would 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 have been able to put a little space between some of these previews and kind of take a step back and say, why isn't this working, or what can I do to make it work better? But uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of adult supervision, <laughs> and, uh, and he had this release date. And I remember at, at, the, uh, at the first sneak preview, the first time the studio saw the movie, the, um, Charlie Powell, who was uh, uh, Universal's marketing guy, he said, it's a monster, Stephen. <laughs> Which was like, oh man, what if, what if, that can mean anything you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, when you, when you look at the later career and you see that he goes on to things like Empire of the Sun, again revisiting World War II, early, uh, it, different aspect of World War II, which of course led to then Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, um, and, you know, historical epics like Amistad and Lincoln. Um, you can't really appreciate the career as a whole if you leave out this film. I think it's just, you, you see certain things that kind of point the way to other things and you see, you know, the films that came before. It, it has its place, you, you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just an essential Spielberg movie. Um, I think it's also an essential John Milius movie and it's certainly an essential Bob and Bob movie because, mm -hmm. I mean, these guys found humor in history. You know, uh, we first got the 60s in Beatlemania with I Wanna Hold Your Hand and then we get um, the 40s. With and if this, there's and, if there's if there's, if there's one one moment in here that illustrates the quintessential Bob Zemeckis gag, it's uh, when the when the Japanese are trying to get the radio on board the sub, and he mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. you know, we have to figure out a way to make it <laughs> smaller. You know, and Bob goes and he makes Forrest Gump. And the whole movie is 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 variations on that kind of a gag. <laughs> now Perry, as an actor, were you feeling it was like? As things were changing, as new new versions are coming in, new pages are coming in, what's uh, well, what's the script was the size of a phone book <laughs> at one point, and it was so many different colors <laughs> because there were so many changes coming out that I and I don't even I hope I have it somewhere, but but it's I mean it's it's really a, a I mean an art piece in itself, but <laughs> um, but I, you know and 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 it was. It was fun to sit there and have Stephen go, well, the tank should go through a paint factory. And then somebody saying, well, <laughs> Stephen, then, you know, it should have paint on it, and it doesn't have paint on it. It goes, okay, so it goes through a turpentine factory. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just that, that ability to do whatever you want to do, um, you know, does that, <laughs> Does that help you or <laughs> ruin you? So, uh, and and again, I I think if he hadn't locked himself into that um, holiday Christmas release date, he could have sorted it all out. But I mean, to me, when you look at this, which makes so much more sense, you you realize, oh, you know, there was a method to the madness that you saw as an actor. You just saw chaos. I mean, you were in the middle of it, and uh, I was saying that when the Dumbo marquee blew up, I caught fire, and somebody put me out. You know, it was just, it was like, it was one of those things where all you saw were 
literally people getting hurt and um, and uh, and uh, it was uh, it was there was not uh, it was OSHA was not a really uh, a widely <laughs> understood term at that time. So. <laughs> But Chris, you had said earlier also that you had to be ready, that day had to be ready perfect for him. Well, I, you know, I, I would say about the chaos that, you know, visually the movie is chaotic, but, but um, the chaos had to be organized extremely well. And I, I'll take a little <laughs> exception in terms of safety because we, we did very, very dangerous things on that movie. And, and what I think it's important for particularly the students here to understand is that you know this movie started shooting uh, a few days before Thanksgiving, 1978, and it finished right before Mo uh, Memorial Day, 1979. So we were at it for better part of seven months. Um, in the context of that time period, 78, 79, the, the tools that were at the disposal of filmmakers today that we take for granted did not exist during that time period. Um, this movie was made completely without computers. It was also made without fax machines and email, which meant that when Bob and Bob wrote a scene for Perry Lang that he needed to learn that night and it was coming off the presses at 5 p.m. and Perry wasn't with us that day. He was going to work the next day and needed to know those lines. A teamster had to take those pages and physically drive it to the house. You know, um, you know, no computers. Yes, there are blue screen and optical effects, but blue screen even was not a very utilized uh, tool at that time. Um, in fact. There were like seven days in pre-production that were devoted to just testing blue screen and its tolerance to having foreground smoke to make sure that everybody sort of knew that if you put smoke in the foreground that what you wanted to later put on a blue screen would be visible. So um, uh, another tool that sort of at Filmmakers' disposals now is the, you know, the remote head crane, uh, meaning a, a, a way of using the camera where the camera operator is not looking through the camera, but he is sitting at a monitor and working the the wheels on a monitor while while the uh, a remote head kind of moves the camera on a crane device. Um, 1941 was extremely special and gifted to be given this French invented Luma crane um, before this sort of tool uh, was invented in America and used by anybody else. And so there literally had to be a school for the grip crew, for the, for the camera crew to, to learn how to use this piece of equipment. And Stephen fell in love with it. So, Invariably, uh, we would have this Luma crane set up all day, and we'd use it a lot of times just where you could use a regular, a regular camera that you look through. It was just easier to leave it on and set it at the at the proper height. But you know, the fact that all of the imagery that you see in the movie, uh, for the most part, is done in camera. Um, I think is really a testament to the level of crew and professionalism that we had in uh, particularly the art department, particularly uh, what is called special effects, but in this movie is really mechanical effects. Uh, smoke, uh, wind, things, fire, things that are done on the set and not added in later in, in post-production. Um, and I think for the time, I think that was one of the, uh, the, the interesting things that, that sort of drove the whole film community to our sets every day was to sort of see the, the scope of this sort of in-camera magic that we were capturing and, every day. And, and old school craftsmanship that just, that really went back since the beginning of film 
And that was, in a lot of ways, the end of it. When you prop guys like Sammy, who it was his last movie, but he had been working since what, the 30s. And, and now you have the, these practical um, effects that, you know, we, it, it, it's the way they did things in movies since the beginning of movies, but then after that, they just ended. And, and it's all become digital. Effects. Yeah, we pushed a real house off. They built a house and pushed it off the cliff at the end. That, you know, wow, was that a miniature? No, it was a real fucking house. It, yeah. it, it went down. You know, we, we crashed a real plane uh, on the back lot of, uh, of, of Warner Bros. Twice. Burbank Studios. Twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephen didn't like the first take. And, you know, we came back a week later. They rebuilt this, they built this amazingly intricate, uh, and very clever trestle that the train that the plane was on, uh, and it was sort of like a block and tackle thing uh, with pulley, where the truck went that way and it made the plane go that way, and then the plane was just going fast enough where it almost got airborne at the end of the track, and boom, it just—it was basically mm -hmm. a slingshot. It, that's right, <laughs> and, that's, and it was a slingshot headed into. We had 100 stunt people on the set that <laughs> night. Really? So, How's that all? Yeah, and I, Terry Leonard, who is a, who's a great yeah. stunt coordinator, who's one of the heroes of the movie. I remember, I'll never forget he, uh, the speech he made to his stuntmen that night, and he said, you know, I want you all to stay in there as long as you can until the little man inside you said, this is the absolute last moment that you can get out alive. <laughs> so. And uh, mini oh, miniature work? Can we talk about the, the pier and the miniature work? The, the, the guy that uh, designed all the miniatures is named Greg Jean. And uh, the, the pier set was built on uh, stage, was it 27 or 29? 29, 29, 29 at, MGM. at MGM, which was the Esther Williams, where all the Esther Williams mermaid water movies were made. So it was, it was built right there uh, in the water, um, it was about I don't know, like a quarter scale. Would you say, Chris? I don't remember the the scale. I don't, um, the Ferris wheel for a time lived as part of sort of the Universal Studios tour. My recollection is like about four feet high, maybe, with the Ferris wheel, or at least one of them. The the um, Ferris wheel that we had in the miniature se set was much taller than four okay. feet. Okay. I mean. Uh, but I don't know those scale numbers that, right. that were actually used. But um, no, it, it, that, and that was the beginning of our shooting schedule. Um, uh, 21 days of not the, not the dog fight over the Los Angeles streets, which was the very end of the movie, but right. the very beginning of the movie was the miniature sub and this, this whole sort of park with miniature uh, miniature uh, tanks and miniature cars and um, the Ferris wheel and um, it was it was quite for a guy like me who is kind of new to the director's guild and doing one of his first movies to go on this sound stage where you know it was all open it was one of the largest stages in Hollywood there was this as Bob said, the Esther Williams pool, um, smoke. I mean, the wave effect was guys positioned on the corners of the tank who were special effects men that had a wooden handle and like a wooden block, and they just sort of did that, and that was the, <laughs> the, the, that was the waves. Um, and this sort of incredible miniature, not only um, set, but the miniature lighting and the miniature explosions that were just I mean, remarkable stuff. Um, the thing yeah. is, uh, your eye really buys it. At least to me, looking at it, it's like the miniatures, the street, and the mm. pier. And, uh, your your eye just buys it because it's actual objects in space, carefully lit, carefully placed little miniature items, things that tell you it's actually full size. I mean, little tricks that um, you know, a talent like Greg. Um, it was just, he was just the master. He worked on, he did build the mothership for Close Encounters of the Third Kind also. I mean, just absolute, the, uh, the king of uh, miniature work. Well, watching this film again, um, I, we see this really odd portrait of the World War II generation as like oversexed and trigger happy. 
<laughs> and it strikes me too that 1979 is the same year that Apocalypse Now comes out. Is this an anti-war film? It's a comedy, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, John Wayne thought it was an anti-war movie. He was Stephen's first choice to play Stillwell. And uh, Stephen gave him the script, and um, John Wayne called him up and said, Stephen, this is terrible. You shouldn't make this. It's anti-American. And Stephen didn't see it that way. I mean, it was a, it's, it's, a black, it's a black comedy. The original script was a lot had a sort of a darker sense of humor than this. Um, Stephen lightened up a lot, a lot of stuff that, that we would have done uh, with, with more of an edge uh, if, if, if Bob and I had made the movie ourselves. Um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, it's not an anti-war movie. It's, it was just, we were fascinated by, by the stuff that actually happened and when we came across it, we said, it's got to be, all, all you can do today is laugh, laugh at this stuff. We, we need to make people laugh at this because how, they were really doing this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, uh, 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 Stillwell actually did go see Dumbo. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> we didn't. We didn't make that up. Did That's, he cry? Uh, did he cry? Did which, he cry? Uh, I, I don't know if he cried, but he, in his, in his diaries, in his diaries, he he said he sat through it twice. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the Dumbo actually opened. Uh, closer to Christmas, so that's a little historically inaccurate that he would have seen it the week after Pearl Harbor, but he did, he did go. So. Well, maybe as a way of finishing, you, there's a story, a John well, Belushi story? There's, there's a million John Belushi stories, but <laughs> um, first of all, uh, it was a kind of a kick for all of us to be around he and Aykroyd. We had known, known them from Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. Um, the blue, uh, the um, Animal House movie had opened up in the months just prior to when we started to film, and uh, uh, Belushi was just, you know, first of all, he was a gentle soul, uh, and um, I don't think he liked to sleep at night. <laughs> um, we had a we had a couple of um, he fell in love with. You know, he was, he was doing Saturday Night Live simultaneously to working on our movie, and the deal was we'd have to send him back to, he and Dan back to New York on Friday and get him back on Tuesday, but they started being so enamored with the L.A. party scene and, and all the stuff that was going on, they didn't want to do that. And in fact, one day, I don't know what ever happened to this footage, maybe Bob knows, but one day they went up to Steven Spielberg's <laughs> house and they were actually not going to fly back and do the show like they were contractually obligated to do, the Saturday Night Live. And they did some parody um, thing at Steven's swimming pool where they said, you know, like, um, we're very sorry that John and Dan can't be on the show this week. They've, we've been, they've been very busy, you know, working on 1941 and they're laying at the pool with girls all around and stuff. <laughs> um, but um, we, we had a couple of things with uh, John I just will share with you. After the miniatures finished, the first 20 days of shooting. Um, the first uh, scenes we did with actors were in this locale called Indian Dunes in the northern part of Los Angeles, and it was the Warren Oates sequence. A lot of night shooting. Uh, we had a very sad thing that happened right at the beginning of uh, the movie, which was Stephen, I think, is a very superstitious person, and he liked to have people around him that he thought were good luck. One of the people he wanted, that he had with him, was his script supervisor, uh, a woman named Charles E. Bryant, who the film is dedicated to. And she was quite elderly. The conditions in, um, uh, out in Indian Dunes were horrific. They were very, very cold. It was night shooting. And she got pneumonia, and she passed away uh, right at the beginning of the movie, which was terribly sad. Um, John, on the other hand, had a, had a different way of coping with the elements. Uh, on day six, 
and the shot is in the movie, there's, there's, there's a scene uh, where he is doing his final goodbye and he jumps on the wing and he falls, lands on the ground. Well, that's him falling, that's <laughs> not a stunt man, that wasn't planned. And, and all I can tell you was that was the day that the Rolling Stones came to the set about four hours before we started shooting that scene. And what they did in John's trailer, I don't know. <laughs> but, but part of that accident may have had something to do with shenanigans with the Rolling Stones. So. And he was a great, great guy and just lovable and, you know. Was and and John, John wasn't hurt either. He he got up got after continue. that fall. Yeah. We, you know, we were so we were, you know, even at that point, we were very concerned about lifestyle and you know things that you know were, were sort of obvious that were going on, and we had this sort sort of prophetic button that that uh, w the crew made up, and it says John Belushi, born in 1941 to 19, uh, born 1949 to 1941. <laughs> uh, so. Anyway. And yes, I would like to thank our guests for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.